A very good afternoon to all the dignitaries present on the dais and all my fellow companions. I, Jyoti Kumari, student manager of Sri Balaji Society, feels privileged to introduce you all to a very august personality, Mr. D. Muthu Kumaran, the Chief Executive Officer of Aditya Billa Private Equity. Sir, holds degree as Chartered Accountant, Cost and Works Accountant and Bachelor of Commerce from University of Madras. Muttu Kumaran sir is having great experience in an international investment bank for a year and in a big four accounting firm for eight years. Sir was also the head of group corporate finance at Aditya Billa for 12 years. Sir has specialized in business strategy, portfolio management, identifying value creating opportunities, fundraising in depth and equity capital markets, structured finance, leverage buyouts and many more. Recently, Sir has also taken over as Chief Strategy Officer at Aditya Billa as an additional charge. Now, I would like to invite Muttu Kumaran Sir to share his experience with us. Sir, the dais is all yours. You know, before coming here, uh, I was just doing the thing that each one of you should have done. How many of you have actually uh, Googled either about me or about the session or about, uh, you know, my experience? Anybody has gone through the website? Where do you find uh, this information? If you wanted to get LinkedIn. Uh, so I did a little bit of a research and the reason why I asked where do you find this information is that the first information that I wanted to give you is that there is overload of information. You know, there is so much information about everything, about everybody, you know, you just don't know, uh, you know, sort of how to find time uh, to go through that information. So, uh, when I went through your website, the first thing that struck me was, in the home page, you have put a paragraph which says, Three Ds are very, very important. That is your values and character. So, which are those three? <laughs> Honestly speaking, if you follow these three, you have arrived in life. If you actually, you know, follow these things to the T, if you, you know, sort of commit yourself to following these three, I mean, you will be a force to reckon with, correct? And to be really frank, this part of the values or identity or mission or vision will be there in every website. What was most attractive to me was the second part of that, okay? So the very next sentence says that we have a paternalistic approach to education and to life and whenever I heard stories and whatever stories little I have heard in the last two days uh, is amazing. And uh, I, I was sitting here um, and you know in the last panel at the end of it when I actually saw the you know sort of uh, uh, send off to them it was very clear there was some kind of an army discipline in actually how you receive people, how you send off people, how you behave in the campus, how you sort of uh, study. So, you know, uh, this is a very, very, very crucial part of, uh, you know, your life because this is the last bit of your formal studies. And I'm sure some of you will do some more studies sometimes down the future. But right after this, most people are likely to work. How many people are going to work? How many people are going to do business of their own, entrepreneurship? So I saw a lot of people raising hands for both. So, you know, I, I mean, it will be wonderful for you to actually work as well as uh, be an entrepreneur. But, uh, the paternalistic approach, it's, it's a big claim, 
you know it, it's quite daring to say that a college student will be actually you know sort of uh, done in the form of paternalistic approach and when that paternalistic approach was written uh, i presume uh, you know this was based on uh, the transaction analysis uh, theme or theory have uh, any any of you have been exposed to transactional analysis pac parent adult child okay good that's wonderful so i presume this paternalistic approach indicates the p there and it's quite daring to say that we will do it and uh, when i read that it just popped out very clearly to me and i was wondering how is it possible that college students you know who is at the fag end of their education is actually going to be subjecting themselves to a paternalistic approach when i saw the last one hour it's very very clear demonstration there is no doubt in my mind so it's uh, it's so wonderful to see uh, you know to to imbibe the discipline in you what is most easiest is to let yourself go let yourself loose and when you do that you'll have a lot of fun but i guess at some cost and that cost will come and manifest you know probably in a couple of years when you start working because you know if you are a you know uh, if you are an mba student you are supposed to have certain skill sets and if you faff around in college obviously you are not going to have it and if you don't have it obviously when you you know sort of don't do the job well it will all reflect so you know it's it's so wonderful i thought the surprise package will end there you know as if that was not enough there was a third part to that paragraph does anybody here remember can anybody say what was the third paragraph sorry any one volunteer can anybody raise hands as to who want to answer that the third part of the paragraph said that we don't take in discipline lightly it's like enforcing reinforcing and fortifying to say that this is our value we will follow this and this so you know it's it's very clear to be and uh, i am absolutely confident and certain you will reap benefit out of this in the later half of your life at the end of the day college students are college students i did see i mean i did hear in the previous session one of the moderators saying that some of you were dozing off and you know being here we could see so you know people could catch them being sort of sleeping and napping so you know uh, then i realized that you work for 365 days a year and not only you work for 365 days a year you work here in this premise you don't get to go out and one person you know who introduced me to this you know i was looking at what could be you know a very good description of such a system you know you get locked into one place the first thing i'm sure many of you go to or jump to is the negative connotation of it you know you're being locked into one four walls into a campus but the person who introduced me to this said it's like gurukul so such a positive manifestation and in 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 uh, in this world you know having positive manifestation is perhaps the most important thing that you need to have and what i mean by that and let me explain to you you know why i said that we are undergoing you know probably one of the longest economic downturn or lack of growth i won't say downturn i would say lack of growth so many people raise their hands for jobs it's not very easy to get and it's not very easy to keep the world out there welcome to reality and if you go through this discipline 
and if you imbibe this positive feeling, I think what you will get is an attitude, an attitude of finding opportunity where there is a problem. So I sincerely hope and I sincerely wish you all the very best, I sincerely hope you know you get there and I sincerely uh, wish you all the very best you know in, in, in times to come. Like I mentioned, you know, there is an information overload in this world. The world has shrunk in many ways. I hate to admit that I belong to a generation one before yours. I am very sure you yourself have seen the kind of changes that we are going through in this world. Most people in this country today can afford to buy a car. I would say, you know, which is many, many times over what it was 20 years ago. So many people take, you know, vacations abroad. So many people you know, use uh, flight as a mode of, primary mode of transportation. Everybody has a mobile phone. Not only do we have mobile phone, we have the entire world in that five inches. Whatever you want to know, chances are you will know. I think a time will come which is not very far away where you will say, why do you have to go to college to study? What do you want to know about? Tell me, I will give you, you know, give me one hour, I will do a research and this is exactly what we did in the college. All we do is actually a case study. Sorry, you were saying something? So, you, everything is in, you know, in your hand. So, why do you need to come to college? In my opinion, two things. And before saying the two things, let me also admit that if you don't come to the college, you are going to while away your time wasting it. So, might as well be more productive. But I think one is you still have to pick your specialization. What it means is you need to find focus. The earlier you get there, the better it is for you. And that is not going to, the specialization is not going to come from Google. You know, you need to think about it, you need to breathe up, you know, every moment. And you need to study for a long time to become a super specialist in an area. So, you know, to pick your specialization, you need to come to the college. And I think the second thing is that you need to pick the soft skills. And discipline, integrity, you know, all these are very basic soft skills and you know, the set of soft skill encompasses is quite a few and these are just very, very basic. So you should be honest. But soft skills is, is a package. Today, leaders in the organization don't deal with data. Very, very few leaders have to smell opportunities but it's the other way around they have to, the leaders job today is to make choices you know there will be enough information and enough people in the system to say you know we have screened the entire market we have mapped out 
we know exactly how to go about finding the opportunities in this market. These are the choices. So, the leaders actually make choices. But cut to 20 years ago, cut to 30 years ago, cut to 40 years ago, the leader's job was possibly to smell opportunities. So, what this means is that you need to have the soft skill to be able to extract the best. And if you are making choice, garbage in, garbage out. So, you are dependent on people. So, you know the earlier generation, you know as you go up in the organization, you used to do more work and more esoteric work, but I think it is now getting inverted. You know some of you are likely to go into an organization or likely to go into a job where your job is to be an entrepreneurial and in my mind that answers the question and the people who raised hands for both questions are correct and that is how in my mind they are correct. They raised hands for saying that I want to do a job, they raised hands for saying that they want to be an entrepreneur. Today every job that you will get into is entrepreneurial. The only way in this cutthroat competition, the only way in this economy which is not you know sort of growing the way it is, it should be or it is desirable is for you to smell opportunities in whatever job you do. And it is that set of soft skills, how do you handle people, how do you communicate, how do you present and how do you deal with disagreements, how do you deal with lethargy. You know when you become a manager you will have some workers who are sleeping. So, how do you motivate them, how do you inspire them, how do you get works done from them. These are the soft skills when you interact with the team, see there once you go into the real world you will have the benefit of a structured organization and you will know the value of structured organization when you go. When there is a designated leader, when there is a title it helps. Today you, you all do not have title, all of you are students and even for the purpose of mock project if somebody is titled as a speaker, somebody is titled as an analyst, somebody is titled as a you know CEO, somebody is titled as a timekeeper. In reality in the bottom of the heart you all know that he is you know he is Rupesh, he is X, he is Nilesh, he is she is X, Y, Z, you know everybody you know everything. So, therefore, but you know therefore, it is very difficult for you to make them actually behave like what their role is. But when you get into the structured organization, you will have the benefit of title. So, you will be able to enforce a little bit of rules. And when I said rules actually I remembered a very very interesting quote. Uh, you know one uh, gentleman uh, wrote and of course, in today's world you know you get some 25,000 quotes in WhatsApp or a joke. So, one guy wrote about leadership, I would rather be an artist than a leader because leaders have to follow rules. So, imagine you know the leader of the organization not following rules, nobody in the organization will follow rules. So, why do I have to grow in my organization to be a follower of the rule? The answer is simple, that is your behavior. You are not going to be a leader for your behavior. You are a leader for what you do differently. At the end of the day and therefore, at the beginning of the day which is now for you, it is important for you to keep smelling opportunities. Keep finding new products, new services, do it differently, do it at a lower cost, 
reach it quicker than others. You know, at the end of the day, those are the strategy, right? To win the hearts of the customer. And therefore, they will open up their wallet. They will be ready to pay or swipe the card or in today's world, enter the pin and give you the money. So, you do not get paid for the behavior, but what you get paid for is smelling opportunity. So, you come to the college to be constantly exposed to a situation where you are learning all these soft skills. And that to me is one more, you know, important reason why you should come to a college for a formal education. So, to me this whole thing ties up in the way that your college has or in an institution has you know sort of laid out its discipline, its commitment, values, hard work, being together all the time. This is the only world for you, you cannot step out. So, whatever is good or bad, it is all here. So, it is up to you to decide whether you have good or bad, nobody can actually make that choice for you. So, to me, you know, this was a perfect example of a futuristic institution. You know, teaching can only take a person that far in becoming an expert. You know, to be an expert, the only thing you have to do is self study or self effort or self experience, you have to push yourself into the situation and constantly keep you know sort of uh, learning. So, uh, I was I was uh, you know sort of uh, awestruck by what I saw in the very first page and I did not even go, I did not have to go any further in that. And you know, uh, therefore, I feel very privileged to be standing in front of you. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, this is supposed to be the opening statement of, so I reached the opening part in 15 minutes. So, you have got a long way to go. You know, when I was asked to sort of speak, I asked the people who asked me to speak, what should I speak on? They said, this one hour dies is yours, you pick the subject and you decide what you want. So, I said the first thing I will do is that I will not show a PPT. So, we will speak. And the second thing that I concluded and decided was that, I will not give you something that you can read in the book. You know, if you want to find something in the book, you will find. So, I will cover some of the subject topics of strategy, business strategy and I will I'll talk about, you know, briefly for 15 minutes on each of the to topic. But I really wanted to take this 15 minutes to at least tell my view on the purpose of education on the one side and the approach of the institution that you are in on the other and as to how in my mind these two reconciles perfectly well and it meets the real objective of what you should be doing in an MBA institution. So, I, I appeal to you if in case you are already not doing, make the best of it. I think you have very little time left in the institution. How many of you are a uh, first year student? You have got a longer time. How many of you are second year student? Okay, how many of you are first or second year? Answer, first or second? You know, that was a trick question to know how many people are actually sleeping and there are. 
but many people got bowled over and said it's a stupid question. So obviously I know it's a two year education, so either you are in the first year or you are in the second year. <laughs> okay, but let me also tell you one more thing. Just the rules of engagement, the only rule of engagement that I want other than the fact that you are allowed to sleep if you want to is feel free to ask questions anytime, put your hand up and you do not have to wait, I do not have a separate Q&A session, there is no flow of this thing. So whenever you feel like asking a question, please feel free. Let me ask one more time, how many people here are either in the first year or second year? So you can look around, you can catch the people who are, okay let, let, let there be one more reason, uh, okay I will come to that. There are certain common traits of all winning leaders, there are many titled leaders. There is a difference between a winning leader and a titled leader. I mean you have lot many, I am used to actually doing a class of 50 or a 60, so it is possible to have more interaction, uh, but let me still try that same format, you know just for one or two questions, see whether it works. Uh, you know I have told you I have not come here because I know more than what you know. I have been in the battle longer than you have been. I have seen real life situation and there is no better substitute to teach you. So I may have some benefit of all those, but in terms of knowledge it will be a shame on both you individually and the institution to either believe or demonstrate that you know less than me. I know for sure you know as much as I know. So when I ask questions, if some of them sound dumb, there may be some hidden agenda in it, but generally I expect that you will know an answer for those questions. So can anybody take a crack on what is the difference between a winning leader and a title leader? Does anybody understand, okay, how many of you do not understand? Oh sorry, uh, let us ask the other way around. How many of you understand the difference between a winning leader and a titled leader? How many of you understand? Okay, only so many? Okay, let me explain my perspective of what is a winning leader. Uh, you know, whatever title you give, Chief Executive Officer, Chief Strategy Officer, Chief Finance Officer, these are all titles. There are there are roles and jobs and you know if you are a human resource officer you have to ensure that there is no you know sort of outage of capacity because people are fighting, there is an industrial relation problem or people are generally taken care of, they are generally motivated, they generally have a common purpose because everybody works hard but you know people pull in different directions, obviously you are not going to achieve any common objective, the business is not going to get anywhere, you know as the Japanese strike system works. Anybody knows how the Japanese strike system works? They manufacture only one shoe in a pair. So what happens? People are absolutely productive. They have produced 100 million shoes instead of, 50, I mean 100 million left shoes instead of 50 million pairs. Can you go and sell? So there is a difference between productivity and you know successful productivity. It is better to produce 40 million right pairs or a 10 million right pairs than 100 million only left shoes. So the title CHRO will ensure that there is a commonality of the purpose. So you go through the process of performance documentation, KRA, you know objective selection, what will you do blah blah blah. They are title leaders. 
what is winning leader winning leader to me are those who achieve what is in the kra which is what is expected of them if they are in a shoe factory if they have to produce 50 they'll probably produce 50 or 55 or even 65 so they are title leader who's doing well title leaders who are not doing well ensure that you only produce left shoes but successful leaders the way i think about it are those who actually not only produce 60 million shoes not only produce it at a cost lower than that they meet their objective generally or exceed their objective but also find emerging trends and you constantly look at emerging trends to ensure either you are not walked over that somebody is coming and actually taking you know a shutting of factory effectively or you ensure by actually smelling emerging trends that you know it's good for future to actually do something which is beyond shoes they find a new emerging market opportunity which will start now but start earning i mean will 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 uh, start producing results over a period of time our forefathers obviously human beings evolved but they were no less intelligent given those resources in the past so our forefathers the best of them planted many trees knowing very well they will never enjoy the fruit of it they did not say that instead of planting this coconut tree or a jackfruit which i will not get anything out of i mean i was talking to mr uh, balasubramanyam from the earlier panel he said that we are producing quinoa in india now quinoa is one of the grains i don't know how many of you like it oats quinoa they are not made in india at all so they are they are creating this market you know somebody is sacrificing their life and a bonus for the year and probably a bigger car and a bigger house and bit more of upside knowing well that they are not going to consume the quinoa or they are not going to get the profits from it so our forefathers have actually planted trees knowing very well that they are not going to get the benefit of it so same way you know an effective a successful leader winning leader is the one who actually smells not only does he produce the shoes not only does he make the profit but he also finds opportunities for the future he will say i mean i'm just i'm not from shoe factory so i don't know but let me just make up one for you know in the last 10 seconds he will say that i will actually produce a shoe which has a wheels on it which will actually go at 200 kilometers per hour so therefore i am actually going to stop the need for car in future that's the winning leader there's a difference between a winning leader and a title leader title leader may either be good or bad in his job if he is good he would have either achieved his objective so there are there are broadly two schools of thoughts here okay one school of thought is to say that you should get the maximum return on capital employed or the maximum shareholder value you achieve it through profits you achieve it through increasing profit sorry increasing sales increasing volume reducing cost substituting blah 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 so that's one school of thought maximizing value for the shareholders the second school of thought which is equally prevalent okay and arguably some of the real winning leaders you know are probably divided down the middle you will find half here half there the other set of people say that the business's objective is to meet the customer's need and there is one emerging trend which is a third trend which is to say that you should have the objective of a leader is you should have the best motivated set of best employees the best motivated set of best employees 
which means he has a two jobs to retain sorry to attract and retain the best talent and number two is to channelize there and the moment you do this their objective will be automatically met nobody need to bother about what is your shareholder value blah 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 you know they will work as a team they will do something which is path breaking they will innovate they will ensure efficiency you know one will not say production is important the other will not say so you know everything will happen i don't know if any of you have read this book by uh, uh, one of the most admired uh, business leaders of this generation mr jack welch anybody know what's the name of the book huh okay so it's called straight from the gut it's about i think probably 10 years old book and you know the whole book is only if i'm not mistaken six topics i mean there are many chapters but there are six topics and uh, he says if you get these six topics right you will have a winning business and if one of them is to say the point that i just said which is the third point of view of the objective of the business leader your job is to have a good people on board the bus attract and retain talent the rest of it will all happen they will figure out amongst themselves which is the best market which is the best opportunity whether you have to make or buy whether you have to you know keep so much inventory whether the pricing policy should be predatory you know they will figure out if you make them work together attract retain is the best employee part and have systems and institutions and motivations to work in the best possible way which is the second part so the best motivated team will be giving you the best business performance that's the third school of thought which is emerging fast emerging and by the way probably 20 years from now that's going to be the biggest because everything is fleeting shareholders value i sort of so some of the earlier panel members referring to it and i'm sure this is you know being spoken about quite intensely the which are the top companies in the world if i didn't do this research before coming here so i may be wrong if i'm wrong pardon me the answer i'm telling you intuitively because i studied this a year ago for some other occasion the answer is none so you know there will be new place created there will be new shareholder value company you know does it mean you know uh, somebody was telling the toothpaste market goes so much undergoes so much changes i'm trying to remember i, I mean it's slipping my mind right now i don't know how i forget it uh the basic product was it uh, was it chocolate no uh nestle no you know it's 100 year old formula nothing has changed in the last 100 years they may add a little bit of a flavor here you know there is a famous uh, case study gillet we are talking about innovation okay i'm jumping topics and you know if you follow it's good if you don't give me a bad feedback because i'm jumping many topics feel free i'm not going through one particular line of thought i'm planting many seeds because there are so many people and some points will hit a spark on some people i don't expect every point to hit a spark on everybody and in fact i don't even expect that everybody will be sparked up at the end of this okay so my idea is i'm i'm putting few sort of thoughts on the table so gillet did a research for many 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 years and you know anybody here feels innovation is not important for a business raise your hands anybody feel who innovation is not important they spent hundreds and of millions of dollars and what they wanted to do you know they were hoping that they will find something out of the world that you find a magical concoction you put it on the face you know after 10 minutes it peels off or after 5 minutes it peels off and you know you get a shaving effect you don't need to run the razor you don't need to put the after shave i mean men here i'm sure can relate to it and i'm sure even you know women when you go through the threading you don't need to go through the pain 
So they just wanted a simple, you know, apply it as an ointment. After 10 minutes, it should peel off. And, you know, that's all. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars, innovation. And you know what was found out at the end of the innovation? The story goes that they came back and they concluded, it is formal, I believe. They concluded that remove one of the three blades in the razor. It's been proven scientifically now after so much research and hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars that you should actually take out one blade from the three blade razor. So what was I getting? What was I getting to is that the purpose of a winning leader is to pick one of the three as his personal choice and go with it. And now that I didn't expect this 10 minutes on winning leader, but now that I have told in my opinion what is winning leader, can now anybody take a shot at, in your opinion, what is the characteristic of a winning leader? The job of a winning leader in my mind is to have all these characteristics, optimist, risk taker, good listener, people person, have a vision. You know, unless you have all of them rolled into one, you cannot find the next winning business leader. See, there are two models of great value creators. One is, you know, break through new products. And the other is to run, you know, get GM out of bankruptcy. That's a very different skill set from creating a next Yahoo or a Google or a Facebook. Now, is one of the two wrong? No, neither is. Can you... At the moment, nobody has found the shoes yet which can run at 200 kilometers or 100 kilometers per hour. So, you know, you can do away with cars. So, therefore, you still need, you know, non-bankrupt gym. So, it will be good. So many thousands of people will be out of job if that goes to bankruptcy. And so many billions of dollars. So many old people who work there for many years, you know, will lose pension, will lose livelihood. So, you know, and can you live without a Facebook today? But I would say, you know, Facebook has its place in the society. That's why, uh, you know, as long as you don't waste time. I mean, for the people who said yes, I will agree with that. And I'll tell you why I agree with that in a minute. Okay? But I'll tell you the positive use of the Facebook. You know, networking, social, you know, information. I think, you know, uh, your number one man still lives in hostel is what I heard. And he still is part of the same thing, what you are you know, sort of going through. So eventually there is never a rest for a good, you know, driven, motivated people. They want to achieve more. For you to achieve more, you have to use time. And if you waste your time on Facebook, and that's why I agreed with the analysis and conclusion. But there is a positive, it's one of the largest, you know, top trading companies and top five companies in the world in market cap. So there is obviously a purpose for their existence. So, you know, there is no one right or wrong model. You have to make your choice. You know, do you want to be a, you know, fixer? There's a book which Mr. Lou Gersner has written on how to make an elephant dance, which is turning around IBM. And IBM for, you know, some of the people, they fathers or uncles or aunts is a dream company to work for. And you know, you needed somebody to, you needed a leader to actually turn it around. In one generation companies are made, companies are marred. So there is no one right or wrong model. So, you know, a winning leader, in my opinion, eventually the definition I follow which captures all the things that you said. You know, it doesn't drop off anything that you said. These are all the elements of, the way I define it, is somebody who delivers a new product or a, you know, you can measure either in terms of product or value creation. Somebody who has delivered one of the two. For you to have had
done these, you would have had to go through all the elements that you just mentioned. Resilience, very, very, very important. The whole world is actually against you when you are trying to build it. That's a that's a force of the market. The positive side of it is that it for the consumer it gives the best best outcome. If you don't have competition, if you can rest on your laurels, you will never be able to. So therefore, you know, you have to live and you have to work in this construct. You have to fight the force of competition and create either a new product or a new value or do it well. That to me is the definition of a strategy. Let me say it another way. Strategy is where you smell an opportunity for what you can deliver. You know, can somebody say shoes is a bad market? No, there is no bad market. A very celebrated uh, uh, business management guru, if I'm not mistaken, you know, Mr. Pahalad, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure, has stated that there is no such thing as bad business in this world. But in a given industry, there are bad players and good players. So a shoe manufacturer cannot say a cycle is bad or telecom is bad, or Facebook is bad. So to each their own. And unless we have all these opportunities, there is no diversity and there is nothing. I mean, we're all going to be telling the land and doing the same thing. So our job is to actually evolve. And therefore, what actually we are going to do is to find new products and find a place for them in the consumer's mind. Make them pay for it and create value in your own companies. So strategy to me is you have to first decide what you are good in and you have to find on the one side. On the other side, you have to define what are the opportunities. And people take big bets. People in the leadership position always take big bets. Take the example of Apple. They missed the trend a couple of times in a big way in the last 15 years, right? And then they came back with a vengeance. Resilience, goal, vision, working together, innovation, delivering a product. And they choose skimming pricing model. None of their products are penetrative pricing. Everything is priced substantially more than the cost of it. And still the number one company in the world. But yet they had few slips. It's impossible for, and when they take, and it's not, I mean, see, you have to imagine sitting in the you know, sort of, uh, job, the gentleman or the lady would go through the big dilemma on whether, you know, you can't keep pumping in hundreds of millions of dollars everywhere. And you can't keep chasing every trend. You have to take your bet. So when you take your bet, it has to pay off and you have to make it pay off. I think it is Mr. Ratan Tata who had a very famous quote. We make the decision and then make work towards making it right. You don't make right decisions. You make decisions and make them right. So that's, you know, there is a book, you know, Larry Bosetti has written on the whole chapter, I think, uh, co-authored by Mr. Namcharan, called Execution. And, you know, it's not about, you know, people have this, uh, let me put it in a polished language. People have this image, glorious image, of saying that best companies pick best, best strategies. If you actually study, it is the best execution which is more important. Like I mentioned, for best execution to become smart output, you need good strategy. Otherwise, you'll be working very, very hard, but not smart. The difference between smart working and hard working. So the difference comes there in strategy. So the role of strategists is to identify the mega trends. There is a glamour attached to this term, you know, strategy, but on the ground, what delivers is a good execution. There's a big book on what's the importance of execution. And if you study historically, it is best performing companies are the best executing companies. 
not the companies just with good ideas. That doesn't take you far. So, when we do, you know, I, I don't want to, let me just make a few statements of where I'm coming from and then I'll tell you why I told you some of these things. I was, you know, uh, I, I have, in the last 15 years I've had two roles. One was corporate finance head. I don't know how many of you know what is a corporate finance. Corporate finance basically is uh, not the CFO role. Uh, and I was for a corporate finance for a large group, a little bit large group. So they could afford, because they are in multiple business, they could afford a separate function of corporate finance. Otherwise, it will be embedded as a part of the CFO office in a single company business. In big companies, you know, world over, there are thousands of corporate finance professionals, and you know, in the top 200 companies of you know, whether you take NASDAQ or India or this thing, everybody will have a corporate finance function. Somebody may call it corporate strategy, somebody may call it business development, somebody may call it finance, growth, strategic initiatives, whatever. Their job is to identify future bets for the organization, fundamentally. And uh, I was part of uh, a little bit of corporate finance and, uh, you know, I was privileged to be part of a group which invested $33 million this span I was working in that and probably we are the company which has the best track record in you know, sort of execution and value creation and all types. Half of it went through organic which is to identify growth areas and markets, new markets for the given existing companies and the balance half is to find acquisition targets. So I have worked on about two dozen uh, corporate finance initiatives which is either merger, acquisition, private equity, you know fundraising, uh, you know, identifying new markets, new geography, new companies to be acquired, two dozens of them, ranging from six billion dollars, which is the biggest acquisition that the group has done, which is Novelis, and all the way to, you know, even a 50 million dollar transaction. So it's a range of transactions uh, to work on. That was one job. The second job that I'm doing currently is actually I am running a private equity for Aditya Villa Group. And they, uh, let me take a chance. Anybody want to take a crack on what private equity does? Uh, let me tell you quickly, uh, private equity is actually identifying new companies and invest and earn return which is substantially more than anybody else. Which means you are supposed to find emerging companies and uh, the highest form of risk capital, therefore the expected return is highest. So when we invest, our IRR expectations are anywhere between 20 to 25 percent. We typically invest in emerging markets. And I must tell you actually, you know, this is a very, very important observation, it's very, very relevant for you. Uh, I mean, all of you may raise your hand for looking for a job opportunity. I want to say this and I wanted to actually end up here. Uh, to leave some time for question and answers if you have any. And uh, uh, I have a few other points which I can't make you know, in the interest of time. But let me tell you, uh, coming from the private equity industry, I can tell you, you have to realize that the, I told you the last five, seven years has been the toughest economic years in the last 20 years. It's very difficult to find jobs. Everybody is recruiting less than what they used to in the past. But in India, across industries, small and medium companies actually have grown anywhere between 15 to 35 percent. And you should see the private equity returns in India and they have done phenomenally well. So the point I am trying to tell you is that, you know, at this point would have been covered to you by many people in many different forms. Jobs change. Don't look for the same job that a 10 year senior was attempting to get in your institution or in your business. Please pay attention to what is the emerging trend. Take a view on it 
and then take a leap. And you know, you are making the very important first decision. You will make many decisions in life. You know, if it succeeds, and I hope for all of you it does, it's very good. If it, if you have taken a wrong bet, because it's not your fault if you have actually faltered on the decision making. Remember, that's the point on resilience. To realize that you have done your bit, you have been diligent, you have done the right thing. So, you know, if it still cannot be the guarantee that you will succeed. If you don't, resilience coming to play. So, how do you get out of that situation and go to something that is. So, please look for jobs and that, you know, from this. Being from, uh, being from this industry, I can tell you the biggest growth in the last 5, 7, 10 years in India has been in the emerging companies. And of course you should remember that for every company that succeeded, there are some companies that failed as well. There is a ratio. So you might have been in the wrong company, you might have been in the right company. But the emerging jobs are all in the SME sector. So let me uh, let me stop here and let me understand, let me ask if there are any questions. I've come to the end almost. I've got five minutes left. Any questions? Uh, so what is the difference between private equity and venture capitalists? Uh, plus, what are the main reasons that private equity is able to generate so much of profit? See, uh, the difference between, you know, I think the best way to answer that question is to imagine the life of a company. Okay? If you are actually, let's say, you know, uh, trying to start a new business, in year one you will need less money, but your visibility is absolutely zero. If you go and ask somebody money and say, I'm going to create this 200 kilometer per hour shoe making, who will believe? Right? So you need somebody to back up, you will create a factory, you will create a test product, you will sell it in the market. So as you grow up, you will need capital. So you will start with venture capitalists who will give less money. And actually there is one before that also called angel investment. Okay, so there is angel investment, there is venture capital, private equity, and you know, then you go to public equity. So public equity, you know, you will, which company can go for an IPO? You know, SEBI is very, very concerned that you know you don't go and over promise and completely under deliver. They are you know therefore track record is an important criteria for a listing. So if you have a track record you will go to private equity, but if you don't then you go to private equity. Sorry, if you have track record you will go to public equity and if you don't you will go to private equity. So it's a that's one simple definition of venture capital versus private equity. The other definition of private equity is in India it is not allowed, but overseas it is allowed that you can actually change debt and equity easily all over the world. In India, you can't borrow from a bank to invest in equity. It's not allowed because RBI believes we need a stable banking system. And if you transfer debt into equity, if you take you know, sort of debt to buy an equity, you might put bank at risk because equity is more riskier. So it's a philosophy of society. So that part of the private equity doesn't exist in India yet. So that's the difference. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Rishika from PIB Finance. So my question is, like private equity, you said that you invest in private equity. So I would like to know how your company works, like in this profile, like, investments only in private equity, or what is the source of? So what we do is that actually we collect money from people who are willing to invest in our fund. It's a closed-ended fund. For those of you who understand the technicality and jargon, okay, good. So, you know, if you invest today, unlike mutual fund where you can invest any time, withdraw any time, in our fund you'll have to invest and whenever we give money back, that's when you get. But there's an expected maximum 7 to 10 years window. And we collect money from people, you know, there are sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, all over the world, uh, big institutions, you know, banks who want to invest 1%, 2% of their investment in this, with the hope that we will give 25% return. They can't put 20% of their investment capital here. They will give small part of this thing, but this delta will add to their total profits in the bank or pension fund or sovereign wealth fund. So we collect money from them. That is one skill. The other skill is to identify emerging companies and earn excess than public equity. I wanted to just close it in last one minute. 
Okay, uh, for those of you who have already seen this, you know, it will be a good refresher. Otherwise, you know, uh, let me quote, Chief Justice of U.S. Supreme Court, John Roberts, gave a speech. In, can you imagine Chief Justice of U.S. Supreme Court? You know, went to give a speech to, you know, uh, uh, congratulate his grandson for graduating from the college. And this is all on the internet. You can see the whole text or you can even watch the video of his speech or read the text. He said that, let me wish all of you bad luck. This is his words, I'm not quoting. Let me wish all of you bad luck. And he went on to explain the rest of the speech as to why he wishes bad luck. What he says, I'll just quote two of them and then the rest of it is all there. Unless you have bad luck, you will not get unfair treatment. You know, you will find that competition is being unfair to you, employees are being unfair, employers are being unfair, you know, your colleague is unfair, your junior is unfair. So only when you are, you know, sort of battle tested for unfair, you will know the value of justice. And only when you meet multiple failures, you will know the value of loyalty. And then he goes on to say, and he says, unless you go through all these things, you will not become a complete man. Not the Raymond title, but something similar to it. An accomplished man. You know, if you're just lucky, if you've got everything your way, very few people get it. For those of you who wish it, I wish them. For others, you know, I sincerely hope that you take big challenges in life because when you take big problems, you have an opportunity to solve big problems. You know, you're far more respected, accomplished, winning leader. So, let me wish you luck in that sense as you get placed. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for sharing your views on to be a positive manifestation, a sense to be an entrepreneur and guide us to find new opportunities in life and to be a winning leader rather than to be a title leader. Thank you once again for enlightening us with your words of wisdom.